Thank you for tuning in and for demonstrating an interest in spiritual things. That is always our goal here to talk about the things of God, the things of the Spirit that He has revealed to us. And I'm so glad that that is what you are interested in. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Holy Father, you are so good and so wonderful. Thank you for giving life to us. Thank you for keeping us up until this very moment. Thank you for giving your word to us that we can see your great power and wisdom and know all of the things that you have done to bring your plan to fruition in your son. Thank you for showing us how we can follow in his footsteps and live lives that are pleasing toward you. We pray that all things be done according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. What I want to talk about today, I've titled the lesson, Better Today. And I think that that title will make sense as we work our way through the lesson why I have called it this. I want to begin by reading from Hebrews 3 beginning in verse 12. I hope that you have a Bible with you that you'll open up to the passages that we mention that we can see that this comes from the Word of God. Hebrews 3 beginning in verse 12. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. What the Hebrew writer does in chapters 3 and 4 after quoting from the scriptures, he takes the time to emphasize several times this word today as he begins to make his, his point out of it in steadfastness in continuing on and he points out that today we have a decision to make and that's to say that right now we have a decision to make and I want to work inside of this thought we're not going to be building precisely on the Hebrews text here but I want us to think about this today this that we're not talking about the ability to change our past because we can't and we're not trying to be better tomorrow because we don't know about tomorrow we're trying to be better today and that is the the meat I want us to dig into as you are examining God's Word with me getting into that thought the past is gone. I'm sure there are points in each and every one of our lives that we think back to the past and we wish that we had done something differently. We wish that we, we had done something or that we hadn't done something, that there was something different that had occurred. But none of us are able to go back to that point in time, <coughs> excuse me, and change the things that we have done or change the things that we did not do. That moment is gone. It's in the past. And there is nothing that we can do to go back and to change that moment. Now, it is unfortunate in this point that there are some who look at their past 
who look at the things that they cannot change, and they use this as a reason to not pursue spiritual things. They use this as a reason to not seek out God and to serve Him. And the way that they use this as a reason to not pursue God, to not pursue spiritual things, is when they look at their past that they are so holy, that they are entirely ashamed of. You look at the wretched and the miserable things that may have occurred, and a statement like this is made. He that is God won't forgive the things that I have done. If the past is gone and it is behind us and there's nothing that we can do to change it and coming in with this thought of God just can't forgive me for those things. As we're working in this point, I believe that we will do well to think about some that God has forgiven, that we can see God's forgiveness, God's desire for us, his love for us, that we can have forgiveness, that he does want to forgive us. You think about David. David's sins can be listed and it's far more than the few that I have on the screen though we can look at these and perhaps consider them his his most egregious in our minds anyway certainly sin is sin but just looking at these particular ones uh, of David's life in his sin with Bathsheba where he lusted after her he committed adultery with her and then he has her husband killed you can read about those events in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and yet in Acts 13 and verse 22 as the gospel is being preached and, and David is referenced he is called a man after God's own heart he desired to do the will of God David found God's forgiveness David was forgiven of his sins because, as you read Psalm 51, he repented of his sins. He turned away from his sins. He wanted those sins cleansed from his life. And as he sought God out in this way, David found forgiveness even after committing adultery, even after murdering Uriah. You think about Saul. Saul persecuted the church and he murdered Christians. You can read about that in Acts 9 and verses 1 and 2 where he breathed out murder and threats against the church. And he got for he got permission from the Jewish leaders to go into these foreign cities and to bind these Christians in chains and to take them back to be held, that they would be tried, and if they were found guilty in trial, they would be put to death. I want to look in First Timothy 1 here. Let's look at First Timothy 1, and we're going to begin in verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 12, we read, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, 
that in me as the foremost Christ Jesus might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. And so he looks at his situation, who he was before, this blasphemer, this persecutor, this opponent of God. He calls himself the, the foremost of sinners, and yet God was merciful to him. God forgave him of these sins. Certainly, we cannot change our past. We can't go back and undo the things that we did and do the things that we can not or the things that we did not do, rather. But what we can do is we can be relieved of that burden. We can't change it, but we can be forgiven of it. We can have God's forgiveness so that we do not have to carry this burden. The only sin that God will not forgive is the one that you remain in. If you will not repent of it, that is turn away from it and turn toward God. If you will not confess it to God in prayer that you might find forgiveness, that is the sin that God will not forgive. Look with me in Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 26, we read, For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. And so here he says that there remains no sacrifice if you go on sinning deliberately. And so how do you change it? Well, you stop sinning. You repent. You turn away from your sin. Turn toward God. Confess that you have sinned. Make that acknowledgement and there is forgiveness in it in 1 John 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's not a select amount of unrighteousness. That's not, I've done something too completely terrible to be forgiven. No, that he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness when we repent, when we turn away from our sins, when we confess our sins. Now, I want to make a point here. I'm going to make it again with scripture with God's word later in the lesson, but I want us to recognize something right here as I talk about this forgiveness and that repentance and confession being necessary. However, this is not the only thing necessary for the forgiveness of sins. You look in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, if you have not been baptized, baptism is necessary for the forgiveness of of sins. That is where we leave our old life behind us. That is where that life of sin, those terrible decisions I made, those good things I didn't do, that's where that dies. It's put to death in baptism and I'm raised up to walk in the newness of life. And then in new life, if sin comes back into my life, once more I can find forgiveness if I will repent and confess that sin. I do not have to carry my past. It is gone and I can't change it, but I can be forgiven of it. As we move into the future, we learn that the future is uncertain. You see, while some let their past keep them from following God, Others let the ever-elusive tomorrow hold them back. And by that I mean the phrase you see, Why do today what can be done tomorrow? That why do I need to get to that right now? 
Why do I need to make that a priority in my life right now? I have plenty of time to take care of those things later. I don't need to give my life to God right now because I can do that later. Right now I am young and I need to, to do these things while I have the energy, while I have the vigor to do them. And I will give my life to God tomorrow. I will give my life to God later. There are a couple of problems with tomorrow. One is that we do not know what tomorrow will bring. James makes this point. Let's look in James 4 and look at verses 13 and 14. In James 4 and verse 13, Come now you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. We do not know what is going to happen tomorrow. We do not know if this will be our last breath. We do not know if we will make it through the night. We don't know if our loved ones will make it through the night. The only one who knows what holds tomorrow is our God. We simply do not know. I think about the parable that Jesus tells in Luke 12. The point of that parable is about covetousness. It tells what we call the parable of the rich fool after having built his, his filled his barns full. He thinks he's going to build another barn and fill it full and he's going to just be set for life. And God says of him in Luke 12 and verse 20, fool. Tonight your soul is required of you. He thought tomorrow was coming for him, and it didn't. We do not know what tomorrow will bring. We don't need to put obeying God off to tomorrow, because what if tomorrow never comes? And to that, some may say, what if tomorrow does come? Which brings us to a second problem with tomorrow. Even if we don't, quote unquote, run out of tomorrows, there's going to come a time with enough tomorrows that we no longer desire to be obedient to God. We no longer desire to change ourselves so that we can be fitting to God's will. Now, the reason I put run out in quotes like that is because each and every one of us are going to run out of tomorrows at some point in time, whether or not we die at an early age we die at an old age. Jesus Christ returns that we might be judged before his throne. We're going to run out of tomorrows. But what I mean is take this thought of running out of tomorrows, and we use that to talk about youthfulness. We use that to talk about we, we're young, and while I'm in my youth, I need to do what I want to do. I can take care of it tomorrow, and then tomorrow, and then tomorrow. And we carry tomorrow into our elder years. And that's what I'm talking about, not running out of tomorrows. We become aged. And so we haven't actually run out of tomorrows. Tomorrow is still here. But I've put it off for so long now that I do not want to change. See, we, we can never run out of tomorrows. 
we might say, while I am still in school, after I get out of school, then I will give my life to God. Get out of school and get busy with our jobs, get busy with work. You know, when things calm down at work, then I will be obedient toward God. Have a couple of kids and things are just so busy at home raising up these kids and it's it. I'll, I'll give my life to God when things calm down and it's tomorrow, 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 until you look back and there's way more yesterdays than tomorrows and you find all of a sudden that you don't have any desire at all. To give yourself to God. That is why the wise writer in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1 says to remember your creator in the days of your youth. Remember your creator before agedness comes upon you. The days spoken of as evil. Remember him when you are young because that sets the precedence for the entirety of your life then that your life is about God because if you want to wait until the very end of life to make life about God. Your heart has been set in the world this entire time, and a heart set in the world, a heart set on the flesh, a heart made hard by sin, all of a sudden has no desire to be given over to God. Let's look in Hebrews 3 and verse 13. Hebrews 3 and verse 13 we read, but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. He says, he says that we need exhortation today as long as it is right now we need it because if we don't get this exhortation, our hearts become hardened. We become tricked by sin and if we keep putting off exhortation of godliness until tomorrow we don't accept it today as long as it is called today but it's tomorrow then sin tricks us a little more tomorrow comes and all of a sudden it's today and we're still putting it off until tomorrow and sin tricks us a little more. Year after year after year of this. What makes us think when we reach our later years that all of a sudden we want to give ourselves to God. Even if we do not run out of tomorrows, the time comes that we just simply don't want to change. We become set in our ways. We need to remember our God in the days of our youth. We need to remember him today so that our hearts do not become hard. Which brings us to our last point. The present is guaranteed. You cannot change the past. You don't know what's coming tomorrow, but right now, this very moment is the only moment that we are given to make the choices that affect our futures. We can't go back and change the past. We cannot step into the future. We are only given right now. With that said, don't carry the burden of your past. If there is sin in your past. Don't say that God won't forgive me. God will forgive you if you submit yourself to him. Do not carry that burden. Accept God's gift of forgiveness today, right now. 
this moment, the only moment that we are guaranteed. As I said earlier in Acts 2 and verse 38, we learn that baptism is a part of this, of accepting God's gift. In Acts 2 and verse 38, and Peter said to them, Repent, which we noted earlier, but he continues, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to note something, that he says that this baptism is for, it's unto the purpose of the forgiveness of sins. Now, when we are baptized, when our sins are forgiven, we learn later here in this chapter that God adds us to the church, but that is not the purpose of this baptism. Baptism is not unto to the purpose of being added to a, a local congregation of people. Baptism is for the purpose of forgiveness. That, that those sins we committed when we did the things that we ought not do, when we didn't do the things that we should have done, God offers us forgiveness. This is his gift to us. Let's look at Romans. Let's go to Romans 6, and we'll look at verses 3 and 4 here. Romans 6 and verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. This is the passage I was alluding to earlier when I talked about leaving our past behind our old self dying being buried being put to death we die to sin in that that is the self that was given over to sin and so we die we die to sin and that stays buried and we're raised up out of baptism into new life we're raised up into this present with that put into the past and so now we are living even as Christ lived by the power of God and we become recipients of his gift let's look at verse 22 but now that you have been set free from sin that occurred in baptism that's where we died to sin but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God the fruit you get leads to sanctification and it's in eternal life for the wages of sin is death but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord Perhaps you are familiar with what is admittedly a rather corny saying, but the saying that says that the only time we have right now is the present and it is a gift where it's making that Play on words of present and gift. Well, that's fitting right here. All we have is the present. All we have is right now. And so accept God's gift. Carrying that into being better today. Don't let that end right there. Don't let your future slip into uncertainty. Decide right now that you're going to be better today. Not better tomorrow. No one has ever woken up tomorrow. Every time I have ever got out of bed, it has always been today. Don't let your future slip into uncertainty. Today, 
decide to be better. Don't let it end in baptism. Grow and become the person that God has called you to be. Let's see that happening once more in our passage in the writing to the Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 3 that we read at the beginning of the lesson, Hebrews 3, and look at verses 12 through 14 with me again. Hebrews 3 and 12, take care brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. So we have to hold it to the end. That does not end in baptism. Baptism is the beginning of our journey in the new life that we constantly, every day, have this exhortation of one another to remain faithful in our God and to become the people that he has, has called us to be, to be given to his works, to be given to his way of living, closing out with Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. And so we want to look less like the world, and we want to look more like God, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we're waiting for Jesus to come back from heaven. We're waiting for his appearing, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. And we learn in 2 Timothy 3 and verses 16 and 17 that it is the scriptures, the word of God that trains us for good works, trains us for righteousness. The present is guaranteed to us, and so we want to use the gift of right now that we can leave our past behind us. Right now, we can be obedient to God, we can be shaped by His hands to be the people that He has called us to be in His scriptures, leaving us with one question Have you? accepted God's gift.